Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the town of North Beach. Uh, my name is Grace Mary Brady. I'm president of the Bayside History Museum. Uh, today, we the lecture that we have upcoming is sponsored by the Calvert Library. So, if I could have all of our Calvert Library people stand up, Jeremy. Okay. If we could have all of our friends of the Chesapeake Beach Railway stand up. Okay, and then our Bayside History Museum friends stand up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad you stood up for that one. <laughs> uh, it's a real honor and privilege to welcome Chris back here again. He came last year and was such a big hit that we asked him to come back this year. Sometimes the weather agrees with you and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Chris is a pretty famous person. He's a genealogist, he's an actor. He's a singer, writer, and historian. Producer, director, motivational speaker, radio talk show host. We so appreciate him coming to the town of North Beach. <laughs> um, without further ado, um, and before I introduce you, Chris, we have to thank our mayor and introduce our mayor of the town of North Beach, Mark, could you stand up so everybody sees who you are? <laughs> All of these lectures and everything the museum does and is able to accomplish is because we're supported and loved by the town of North Beach. Okay, Chris Haley, are you ready? Oh, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Bring on the show. I don't remember exactly where this is done but uh, I, I think it's something that's very festive. And I see this little aisleway right here. Now, as, uh, as Gracie mentioned a little bit in passing, that, that's, uh, that I, I guess my, my core training is as an actor, entertainer, performer, whatever. Um, oh, she both, whatever it is. Uh, anyway, so where is it when you have an aisleway where people run through the aisle and you get high fives as you go through the aisle? What Ellen, you get over Right? Is, is any other event where they do that? Yeah. What other events do they do that? American Idol. American Idol? Price is right. Baskin Robbins? What? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go to the back there, where one of your city council, what's, what's the city council, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Mayor. Mark. The, the mayor, no, but, but, but hand me the camera. See, when you're a performer, the mayor, the mayor is way up here, but when you're a performer, the cameraman's up there. Mickey Hummel. Mickey Hummel, that's right. See, so I have to go back here with, with uh, Councilman Hummel, and I'm going to come through, and then I'm going to high-five you guys as I come through. <laughs> Because that's just going to get the energy going, and it's just something very different. Because I'm sure when, when, when the mayor was elected, I'm sure that's exactly what he did. Yeah. He had all of his constituents. So uh, I'm just going to count to three, because I want to make sure people have the right timing to get your hands out. Now, you sitting down there, chances are you might have to go like either this or that. Now, if you'd like to be on camera, it's probably a good idea to go like that. <laughs> so if you're over here, what does that mean? That means you go like... This. <laughs> so you'll be on camera. See, this young lady has it already. Okay. <laughs> what, uh, and, and Gracie, if you could just do me a favor and just say Chris Haley again. <laughs> and welcome, Chris Haley. <laughs> that was so spontaneous. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for being here, especially on a day when I know it's, uh, <laughs> this is probably our one good day this month, it seems, and then, <laughs> then next month, is, uh, is, well, this last week, it seems like we're going to have issues, and again in March, too. I, I know, I think uh, some of you were here last year, too, when I uh, was so honored to come here and had a great time. Um, the weather was a little bit better. I don't know if the temperature was any better. I think it probably was just as, uh, just as cold, so this is probably better temperature weather, though. But I know I many of you have to go home and, and get your uh, pigs in blankets and your nachos and get ready for the Oscars. So I don't want to take up too much of your time because some of you are probably, you know, you, there's probably Oscar pools going on here, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Oscar pools going on too, so I don't want to take too much of your time from that. Um, the overview I'm going to give you, and often we get a little bit more specific, but I do say a little bit more specific about some of slavery-related items, people, 
data regarding to Calvert County and Maryland is based on a project that I oversee at the Maryland State Archives called Beneath the Underground. Primarily, this program began uh, in 2005, at least that's when I really had a department, because that department was funded by the Department of Education, a grant that paid, paid for three, almost four years of a staff. Then we had grants from the National Park Service and also another grant from the Department of Education that paid for three more years of a staff. Otherwise, I only have one person <laughs> in my staff, and that's not even me. I do have two people, including me. Primarily, what we have looked at is the lives of African Americans, both free and enslaved, primarily through the mid-19th century, which is to say from 1830 to 1880. The we've gone through about half of the counties in the state of Maryland. The ultimate goal would be to go through all the counties in the state of Maryland at that time. The, the core way of how we do this is just trying to go through basic primary documents. And when I say primary documents, those are the type that are here no matter what. They're not the documents that you, got, you write a letter to someone or you write a, I mean right now you write a text to someone or something of that sort. These are documents that are government documents that are there basically because you are here because you were born, because you exist. There are some documents that are here no matter what. The other document that is also a primary source, which we're all very familiar with, are of course newspapers. Newspapers which, as we know, chronicle everything many of us do, one way or another, and in this instance, those newspapers chronicle property, just as it does today, and the property were human beings or enslaved African Americans. And those documents were so explicit in how they described people that it was the closest thing we could get to a photograph. Because again, there was no photography then. Very rarely, say around 1860 with Matthew Brady, but very seldom. So really, if you had property that you lost, a horse, I don't know, a piece of furniture, whatever, or your black person, then you had to describe them as well as you could because you wanted your property back. So those are the two primary sources, I think it's two primary sources, the newspaper and also the federal census. Mm -hmm. And when I mention the federal census, I think that's very important because whether you're um, a, 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 a senior citizen or whether you just came out of the chute, you are already a part of history. Mm -hmm. As I tell kids in third grade, and at this point, we actually even do presentations for kindergartners now, as far as, as far as genealogy goes. Kindergartners who are five or six, and I tell them, you are already a part of history. And I'm like, well, you ain't finding me, man. <laughs> and there was, I said, have you guys ever heard of a birth certificate? And usually they sort of kind of have heard about that. I said, this birth certificate, this document is so important that even the President of the United States has to have one. And, and you know, maybe they know that, maybe they don't know that whole thing. Um, and I said, and if you guys are five years old and it's 2015, then you probably have another document that you're already on that's going to be here forever and ever and ever. And that's called the federal census. So you are already on two pieces of paper or two digitized documents that will be here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, they're like, five years old, what's that mean? But still, they sort of get it. And that's what I tell people sometimes when they sort of wonder about history, how valuable it is or isn't, and when I try to push for funding to keep history going, to keep history programs or social studies programs going, because all of us are a part of history, whether we don't do anything that we necessarily personally feel are uh, earth shattering We are already a part of history whether we like it or not. So, Vanna? I'm ready. ready. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, again, this is one of the things that, that we like to bring up uh, in the archives and my new presentations about African American history is just a reminder that these two people are native born to Maryland because many people don't know that. And I go to, to uh, presentations around the country and also certainly within the same state and many people, or just to say kids and adults, think that Harry Tubman and Frederick Douglass came from somewhere further south. 
I mean, it could be, I don't know, Alabama or Georgia or one of the Carolinas or even Virginia, but they do not know that these two iconic figures, arguably the most famous African Americans, certainly in the 19th century, uh, are from here and from the Eastern Shore and are from two neighboring counties, Talbot and Dorchester. So I always want to put that up there to just re to let people know what they don't know, but also so that we can sort of claim them. Because I think it's very important to know that, that those figures are actually a part of this state. Now, if I was doing this for DC, I might still say that because he ended up living in DC. If I was in New York, I would talk about both of them because they ended up having homes in New York. But still, I think it's very important to, to claim these people because so often I find that when people talk about African American history, certainly involving slavery, that Maryland is very much overlooked. It's, it's often about the South. It's the same states I find that people talk about when they consider civil rights. When they talk 1950, when they talk 1960, when they talk those issues, those states such as Alabama, such as Tennessee, such as Florida with St. Augustine, such as those issues, such as Selma, Alabama, those are the same states that people will, will feel slavery existed in back in the 19th century. But there were the border states, too, of which Maryland was one. So I always bring that up first to say that these are two iconic figures within our study, within Maryland, but it ain't all about them. Next slide. And that's part of why we do this study, to bring out the, the facts about so many other people. But that said, one of the things that's so fascinating, I think, about being able to really look at these documents that, again, are private in some cases and sometimes governmental, is that some of these documents will, will validate, substantiate, or confirm the existence of these famous figures. This is, if you can, I don't, you probably can see the top of Negroes ages as follows. This is a ledger of Negroes for, I think, don't remember if it's Hugh Auld or whatever. But, um, but anyway, within this ledger are the names of the person he owned, Frederick Douglass's owner. And this name, which is actually right down here, is Frederick Augustus, the son of Harriet, and February 1818. And so that's the actual ledger listing Frederick Douglass's birth. And that's something that's an actual court document because he a part of this ledger is a part of something that goes into the this, this state of Maryland record. So that's something we have. Next slide. Harriet Tubman. Many people have said that these are the numbers associated with her, her legend as far as the actual escapes going back and forth into only Maryland, mind you, only Maryland to, to help people find freedom. Via different sources, we have found that those numbers, we don't really know where those numbers came from, except that we believe they were just mentioned in Sarah Bradford's biography, uh, which I think was 1869, I think that's the biography. Uh, but, but Kate Clifford Larson, who is, I would say, the preeminent Harry Tubman scholar, has not found substantiation for that. We believe it's more like, she believes, that it's more like seven, nine to 13 actual escapes or rescues and 70 or so people who she actually helped free personally. Next slide. What sort of goes along with that is that this is a document we found in a newspaper. I know it's very dark down here, but this rose color looked good when it was on my computer, but anyway. <laughs> Baltimore America and the Commercial Advertiser. This is a newspaper account in 1860. I think it was uh, July, July of 1860. I don't have the date here. Well, the date. June 5th. Oh, June 5th, yes. Yeah. Great, June 5th, 1860. But uh, who wants to read what this, this is? Now, this is just an accounting from a newspaper. You could find, there could be a, what I'm doing now, someone, Sarah Newman could write something about me today, and it could say something basically like this. This was written about Harry Tubman in 1860. Anyone want to read that, please? Five dollars. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I don't even write. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding. I'll tell you this. <laughs> um, a female conductor of the Underground Railroad at the late 
Great Women's, excuse me, Women's Rights Convention at Melodian Hall, Boston, the most interesting incident was the appearance on the platform of a colored woman, Mrs. Harriet Tubman, who has been eight times south and brought into freedom no less than 40 persons, including her aged father and mother, over 70 years old. She has pro she had she had a prolonged and enthusiastic reception. Thank you. Um, that was in the newspaper. In what year? 1860. 1860. Now, mind you, 1860 is when slavery was still in effect. Mm -hmm. So there's also the reality that by her saying this, she's in Massachusetts within the time frame of the the. Um, Fugitive Slave Act, which was renewed or re, re uh, I don't want to say reinvigorated or whatever, uh, from 1790. So she still could have been caught and brought on charges for doing that. So it's very brave to be out in the open just saying what I've done, who I am. Because I, in difference to Frederick Douglass, who had had his slavery, who had had his freedom bought, Harriet Tubman never did. So she still could have been captured and charges brought against her for helping people escape. But again, that's in the newspapers. Sometimes there's facts within newspapers which we were able to find. This is an overview of our project at the Maryland State Archives. That's the website, HTTP, blah, 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 blah. And uh, this is the overview of how we approach things. Case studies is when we go through some of these uh, primary documents and secondary documents that we find, and we create a biography on these people, which I'll briefly go over to, which is to say, if I find a runaway ad on someone, and then that person I'm also able to find within a census record, and then I, I look to see what they are, um, where their owner was, and I look to see the taxes that that, owner, or that that owner was paying, and I see who lived there, and within that runaway ad it may mention that more than just one person ran away, and where the person was running to, with whom the person was running, that becomes a story, and that becomes what we call a case study. And so that's one section where we have it broken down into all the different counties of Maryland, but some of them we haven't touched on yet, but many of them we have, and if you were to click on any of these, you might find some regarding your county. I don't know if everybody here is from Calvert or, or not. Calvert is what we're, tr we're putting in a grant right now to try to explore Calvert County more from the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority. Uh, what you should know, and perhaps do know already, since you're here, you might have some kind of a history event, is that there was this big old fire that happened and that destroyed a lot of records, approximately before 1882, because I know that's when many of the records that we have now start, 1882, which again makes it <coughs> very challenging to find anything prior to that for Calvert County, because they just don't exist. So part of what this, this effort that I, I'm doing right now is, is to hope that perhaps within your own genealogical or biographical or historical leanings, you might think of something or find something that is of historical significance for years and years past and might donate that to the, uh, the Bayside History Museum or something. Because the history that is your own might also relate to someone else's. And with those, putting those different pieces together may, may create a larger story. And then some of those years prior to 1882 may come more to life. And next slide. <laughs> That's just to keep your eyes moving. Because I know at some point in the day, it's like, oh, I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> it's very important, I think, whenever, whenever one talks about slavery, and when everyone talks about th this, this issue at all, is that, is that it wasn't just because people were mean. You know, it wasn't just because white people hated black people. You know, it was because it was money. It was because it was about property. It was about economic power. And economic power was large in slavery. And to show you this is what this, uh, this type of a, uh, I guess overview is meant to do. Measuringwealth.com I think is a great site I use it all the time. 
And what it does is that you are able to, and it's not just English, it could be uh, different languages, French, um, British, the pound, what have you. You can put in the denomination you're looking at, you put in the year you're looking, you're looking at it from, and what you want it to calculate up to, which is to say, here, I put in, uh, they had an argue, an article about the average amount for an enslaved person uh, value in 1860 was $800. When I put that in ResumeWealth.com, it said, what's the equivalent cost or value in 2014? It was $17,100. So I put that out there just to, just to sort of remind people that not to say that I, God knows, I wouldn't turn down $800 right now. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> but, but I wouldn't turn down $800 right now, and I sure enough wouldn't turn down $17,000 very easily. So as morally wrong as we know and believe slavery was, and how much we often say and how kids will say and people will say, oh, I never would have done that. There's no way I would have done that. If you're brought up, if you wake up, if the first thing you realize is that this person who is of a different skin tone or, as I'll show later, the same skin tone is your property and they're worth $17,000, and your family tells you that's what we've always done. How easy would it be for you to say, yeah, I think that is wrong, bye. I mean, how easy would that to be? And so, just to show a little example of just com comparables here, iPhone, $200, iPad, $500, computer, $500, Xbox, $300. I know some of these probably kind of low now, because it's after Christmas sales, right? Um, car, $30,000, and 2013, the uh, national average for the cost of a home was $189,000. National average for a home in our very well-to-do Calvert County was $390,000. So just think of that as far as being our current uh, economic mindset. And that's what we're talking about people who had enslaved individuals as their primary source of income and value. So, going through it a little bit further and looking at the, the federal census findings of statistics, the value of Maryland slavery. Now again, this is just Maryland. I'm not talking about all the other states that had slaves at that point. I'm just talking about Maryland. It was approximately 1.5 to 2 billion dollars is what the value of slavery was in Maryland alone in approximately 1860. So how did I calculate that? We just saw that $800 is what the value was in 1860. Times 87, 189, that's how many enslaved people were listed in the census in the slave schedule in 1860. So there were, were 87,189 enslaved individuals. So average out $800, 69,000, 69 million. $751 and $200, and that's in 19th century dollars. So, we calculate that up to what it would be today, $17,000 per, $17,000 times 87,189 is approximately $1,490,000,000 was the value of the enslaved population of Maryland in 1860. Now also in MeasuringWorth.com, they have a uh, different breakdowns because that's more a literal breakdown, as far as possible, the literal breakdown of what the value was, but also there's sort of a comparable value of economic worth, which is to say that if you have, let's say, um, if you have a million dollars and you live, I don't know, what, whatever street you live in, if you go on a street with me and you have a million dollars, wow, I'm looking at you as being a rich person. I really am. If you have a million dollars and you live on the Gold Coast, which is an area in Washington, D.C., on 16th Street, a million dollars may look like not so much. You know, because there's other people who are you know, looking at 10 and 20 million dollars. So the economic value of that is approximately two, oh, I see there's so many numbers that this beyond, but it, 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 
economy cost of that, proje that project is $267 billion. So that's the value of this, of this institution at that time, financially. And that's one reason why, again, never to say that it was okay, but to say that one reason why it was fought so hard, both sides, to keep and to get, because that meant so much financially to the South, and why it was a big crime to, to do what we all feel is morally right and sound to do, because it was affecting someone else's livelihood in a huge way. And is that just Maryland? That's then? just Maryland. In other states, it would be probably but, more. And, and some states more, some states less. Mm -hmm. Some states less. Yes? That $800, was that for men and women? or was that That's an average? average for men and women. Now, it, it really, again, that's an average. And you know how an average, there's something that somebody's only $5, somebody's $1,000 or $2,000. So it really is an average. And part of what, what also is to be considered when you think about economic value is that the value of appreciates or depreciates, which is to say, and I don't know if I have that in any, any slide coming up or not, but, but the value of an enslaved person is the value that they make work for you. Which is to say that a slave person, if you, if you have them from the age, they're male, and you have them from the age of, say, 15, and then around the age of 45 is when you might have given them or give them a gradual emancipation. Maybe at that point you're, you're freeing them or what have you. You've got about 20 years out value of it, and that could be roughly $120,000 of value you receive from that person's work. So part of what I was talking about as far as case studies and how, and how complicated this whole situation is and how it wasn't just a matter of, um, of yes or no and property and property owner. There was the other part which makes it so sticky and that's like there were people involved and the person who was the slaveholder knew that there were people involved. <coughs> this is one of the first stories that we uncovered. And, and let me see, I'm trying to think who, is that pretty much at the bottom, Gracie? Is that the after the bottom one? Yeah. Okay, who wants to read this ad? <coughs> who can read this ad? $100 more. <coughs> away from the subscriber on the night of the 21st instant by Negro Girl Cinderella, about 22 or 24 years of age, very, very pleasant. And spoken to of a light yellow complexion and about four feet five or six inches high, <coughs> took with her a variety of clothing. She has a husband living in Baltimore by the name of Abram Brockton, who is supposed to have taken her away from home. I will give $75 for her arrest so that I get her again or $100 taken out of the state. Edward H. Brown, this year, George F. Right. Thank you. Now, part of what this story is, I, I was fascinated by this, first off, because I was literally just fascinated that there was someone who was, who was, who was named Cinderella. And, and I can be literal. That's the first thing that caught my eye, that there's a slave person with a name named Cinderella. That, what a, that's not one more. Yeah, that's not one of the things I would, I would think of. Then I look a little bit closer, and she's 22 to 24 years of age. She's four feet, five, six, or six. That's really, you know, that's really, really short. And this is a full grown woman, four feet, five, six inches high. And she is of a, what does it say, a light Night yellow Night. complexion. So she's very fair skin. And I'll show you an example of, of what I, what that might imply too. So that struck me already. Also, this person, uh, who is the overseer, not the owner, the overseer for Mr. Worthington is putting out this ad and, and he has a good hint of where she is or where she's not. She has a husband living in Baltimore by the name of Abram Rodman. So it, it's one of those things that when you read it, and it there's the initial uh, biographical data of it, but then there's the biographical story within it which is that this person who enslaves this piece of property, because that's what it is, this is a property 
knows that this person has a husband, and that might be what they're trying to do is live with their husband. The gist of this story is that Abram Brogdon was found guilty of helping his wife to escape, of soliciting aid to help his wife escape, and was sentenced to four years in jail in the in Maryland Penitentiary for that. Now, subsequent to that, what happened that there were many people, white people, in the area who thought that was wrong, who even slaveholders thought that was wrong for him to be charged, well, for him to be found guilty of a charge which they could actually see justification for. He was actually trying to free his wife. And I don't know if I have it in the next slide. Can we go to the next slide? I don't know if I have it or not. Okay, I don't. Um, so, can you go back? Can you go back? You want to skip that? So, um, the gist of it is, is that so many people, uh, white and black, petitioned for his freedom, Abram Brogdon's freedom, because they did not feel it just for him to be sent to jail for helping his own wife to escape. And there's, they took to the governor, and after two years, he actually was released from jail. And one of the reasons she did run away was because she felt that she was going to be sold south, so she would not be able to be in any proximity to where her husband lived. And it turned out that she was sold south, and by the time that her husband was, was pardoned, she had died. So it's one of those awful stories that you know happens. But but just to, but just again to show the the, the, um, the I don't know the complicated nature of this institution. Now we go to the next slide. Okay, who will read this? Thirty dollars reward. Ran away from the subscriber the 9th of April last. A Negro man named Palmer, <clears throat> about five feet six inches high, strong built, bow legged. He had a white wife near Mount Pleasant, Perry, Anne Arundel County, living on Isaac Simmons' land. The above reward will be paid by the subscriber to any person who will bring him home without any other charges. Thomas Boyd, Georgetown, July 23rd, 1794. 1794. Georgetown, which I believe that's in probably Georgetown, like Georgetown, D.C. Yes, it is. That, that, that's what that area is. So, the, and now, Part of what this is just to show, and many of these ads here, believe me, I'm not necessarily searching for them. It's just I'm looking through and looking through and looking through and then I just find something that's interesting. It's just to show that no matter what we think about how things might be, blacks and whites were getting married even then. You know, one was enslaved and one was free and they were getting married even then. And, and it's just, I think it sort of flips on the, on our, our on its head or on its however that term is, um, all this, the suppositions that we have about how something could not have possibly happened in that time frame, because we see this in the newspaper. And 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 again, one thing about this ad, and I as I found about many ads, is that look at how non, let's say, uh, slanted it is. I don't think there's any word that's an adjective that says that awful white wife or that terrible man. It's just like, these are the facts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also something to, to, to really notice about some of these ads and, and just, and they're still like, this is what's going on right now. Next slide. Here's the, now I don't know if, if this is hard to read, I know, but again, the complications, so I'll read it for you. Four, five dollar reward, so again, as I said, it varies a lot, five dollar reward. Uh, caution, my daughter Zippy Jones, having on Thursday night last, without my knowledge or consent, got married to Wiley Bailey, who had already two wives living. <laughs> and I, fearing that she will leave here for the north, this is to caution all persons connected with the railroads not to take her as a passenger, as she is not free. She is of a yellow complexion, has a large head of hair and a flat nose. Bailey is an old dandy and also has a flat nose. If any person will return Zippy to me at the corner of Argyle and Fleet Street, I will pay the above reward, Robert Jones. So, 
How many crazy things are in that? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. That's his daughter. That is his daughter. That's what I'm gonna say. But is right. he? But that's his daughter. He's a slave holder, right? Yes. Okay. So that's not always clear in that one. Mm -hmm. That's not clear in that. Yeah. See, I think I think it. I think that is what it is. Um, and I've looked to see a little bit later in a, in a runaway ad, and no, not an ad, in, in a census record, and it shows Robert Jones as being free, but I don't know if it's the same Robert Jones. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I can't tell. Um, so it's just, it implies to me, just because there's something that, that could be said, and I don't know if 1841, that there, there was a law that if you free your family within 30 days, they'd have to leave the territory, or they would have to leave the county in which you live. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an 1832 law, but I'm not too sure. But this ad to me was just one of those ones that brings up so many complex ideas of that. This property is my daughter, and I want my property back. And I also <coughs> don't like the fact that my daughter's run off with this guy who's a bigamist. You know, it's just so many different things there. And she's of yellow complexion, which means she's mixed race. And this guy, Bailey, is he of mixed race too? He's talking about this flat nose. I mean, what is it that he's talking about? <laughs> Next slide. Oh, dandy. That, now that is a slanted term. I mean, that means that he's he's like, I guess a gigolo. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now this is something I want to bring up too, and something I I, I wanted to bring up some new things this time from last year, whether people were here or not. Just so it was like, well, I saw that last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is something that I think is what we just don't, we, we just don't think about it. And, and it makes sense because it's not brought to our attention. But, but it's true. <laughs> and it's just as it with the story of Cinderella. What I did was I just pulled some ads and then I went into Google and I put some of the descriptive words in Google and, and, and then I just hit, I entered it for images. And these are some of the images that would come up. Now this image, I'm pretty sure, applies to this one. So as it says, notice was committed to the prison of Washington, D.C. on the 17th of October, 1833, as a runaway, a Negro man who calls himself William Thomas. He says he is free. He says he came from New Orleans, had already committed gray castanet coat and pantaloons and white hat about half worn, half worn. So these are the words I put in to the internet. Very, I'm not slanting any of them, just putting in these words, maybe quotation marks, what did they come up with? Very bright, nearly white. He is a stout, likely, and well-made fellow, about five feet seven and a half inches high, between 21, two years, 21 years of age. So basically, I would put in, I don't know if I would put bright, nearly white. Probably I did. Uh, stout, five feet seven, 21, and 22 years of age, and, and, and male. And then I get a picture like this. And then the one at the top, uh, manager. As an overseer on a farm in Baltimore, a married man whose wife is capable of taking charge of the dairy would be preferred. Then at the bottom, who offers a reward of $25 for the apprehension and return to him of a mulatto boy, meaning that they're mixed, black and white, who ran away from him on Sunday week. He is of a very light complexion, blue eyes, blue eyes, light brown straight hair, light brown straight hair, is about five feet seven or eight inches high, and has the joint off the forefinger of his hand. So again, I put in this, from the point where it says very light complexion, blue eyes, I put that into the internet, and this is what I come up with. Now again, is this by any way an exact scientific study? <laughs> no. It's just saying that for those people at that time frame who are looking to get property back, they know what that means. Mm -hmm. They know what they're looking for if it's going to say uh, white, near, very bright, nearly white, very light complexion, blue eyes, they know. And that's what they, would, they could see. And it's just a reminder that, again, when you see so many stories or so many, so many representations of slavery, you will always see a person who's black, a person who's light-skinned, but you won't see that light-skinned. I mean, even in you know, my own family story, Queen, Halle Berry isn't that light-skinned. No, that's not what you see. But this is the reality of what slavery dealt with. Next slide. This is something else that's very unusual, and I guess I needed to start running a while ago. But uh, and this just says again things that we thought never, never, never would be considerations back in the day were. So who wants to read this? Was committed to the jail of Baltimore City, 
and County on the 23rd day of September 1851 by D.C. H. Boyley Esquire, a justice of the peace of the state of Maryland, in and for the city of Baltimore as a runaway. A Negro man who calls him that man? <laughs> 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 he calls himself Mary Ann Walters, about 28 years of age, five feet two and a half inches high, style built, very black complexion, and has a scar on his left ear. Said Negro had on, when committed, a dark figured Muslim de Lane dress. Whoa. Blue <laughs> velvet, Mantella, white satin bonnet, and figured skull. Says he is free, was born in Elkridge, and has been hiring out in the city of Baltimore as a woman for the last three years. <laughs> wow, which one I did. The owner of the apartment is a Negro, and the person to come forward, prove property, pay charges, and take said Negro away. Otherwise, we'll be discharged according to law. William H. W.M. H. Councilman, Warden of Baltimore City County Jail, September 29th. Okay, so there you go. So anyway, <laughs> again, and, and it's just just randomly looking through these ads to see what's in there, and just um, and just I don't know. It's just the, just the fact because even in this ad, there's part. Imagine if something like this was written today in the newspaper. Can you imagine how many slanted statements or or uh, editorial comments would be thrown in there somewhere? I mean, if, if I'm reaching, if I'm reaching, I could say that um, the owner of the above described Negro is requested to come for approved property pay charges and take said Negro away. I mean, that's the only way I could sort of be reaching to say that, take this away. <laughs> <laughs> but, I just, but I think I'm reaching to even say that. You know, otherwise, he will be discharged according to the law. And that was, this becomes a part of the law what's committal notice. And a committal notice means that someone was just, could be stopped on the road, a black person could be stopped on the road, and they'd have to prove whether they were free or if they were enslaved, whose property they were, and then by whose right did they have the freedom to walk around, were they on a tour, were they on an errand, were they hired out, that's what they would need to have. If they didn't have that, they would be committed to a jail until someone, as it says here, would prove property or prove this person's identification. I mean, this person does say that he's free. So he would have to prove papers, but if he doesn't have papers, because apparently either the person isn't, isn't owning up to it, or he didn't have them with him, but then he would have to have someone show up and vouch for the fact that Mary Ann Waters, I've always known this person as being free. Next slide. Now this is something else. This is a very recent story, and again, found in the 1860 newspaper called Baltimore Saturday Night uh, Independent, not even. That was a newspaper in 1860 at Baltimore. That's just, now that's me actually looking at this paper, just to prove that I didn't you know, go somewhere and do Photoshop. <laughs> um, so 1860, so go to the next slide. And this is what I saw. And again, this, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with our topic, except for the fact that to open up our eyes to history, and how history sometimes really is a repetition of what's happened before, except now, when in our 24-7 multimedia world, we can't believe it, that some things happened before. So, let's see, where's the part? Okay, so, so I look at this thing that says queer marriages, right? And I'm thinking, queer marriages, what's that about? Because first I look at this, feminine journalists, that's what I first looked at that. I said, wow, what they talk about feminine journalists in 1860? What women were writing of that prominence? I mean, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe, you know, she wrote her book, but where the feminine journal. So I'm looking at that. That's above the fold, as we call it. I go below, below the fold, and I see this article, and and this is what it says: Among the many remarkable marriages on record, none are more curious than those in which the bridegroom has proved to be of the same sex as the bride. Last century, there lived a woman who dressed in male attire and was constantly going about captivating her sisters and marrying them. On the 5th of July, 1777, okay? So we're going to step back a second. 1860, but now we're talking about 1777. She was tried in a criminal court in London for thus disguising herself, and it was proved that at various times she had been married to three women and, quote-unquote, defrauded them of their women and their clothes. 
A little bit further down, in 1773, a woman went courting a woman dressed as a man and was very favorably received. The lady to whom these not very delicate attentions were paid was much older than the lover, but she was possessed of about 100 pounds, and this was the attraction to her generous fraud. But in the intended treachery was discovered, and as the original chronicler of the story says, the old lady proved to know it. So then, you know, so I look at that, I think, okay, well then, and, I, and I, I, I mentioned this to someone else too, they said, well, this is just a fraud thing, you know, this is someone who was just trying to get over, they're trying to get money, so they, just, they were just hiding themselves, you know, they were disguising themselves as a woman to marry somebody else, to get the dowry, okay, so it's not really, I mean, it's a queer marriage, but it's not a queer, quote, unquote marriage. <laughs> but then right at the bottom it says, a more, right here, a more extraordinary case than either of these was that of two women who lived together by mutual consent as man and wife for 36 years. They kept a public house at Poplar, and the wife, when on her deathbed, for the first time told her relatives the fact concerning her marriage. The writer in the Gentleman's Magazine, 1776, who records the circumstances, states that both had been crossed in love when young and had chosen this method to avoid further opportunities. Kind of amazing. And again, this is, that's to show that some things come around, go around, but you know, nobody talked about it back then. Mm -hmm. But also, to you know, sort of instill more value in the records we have today, in the, in, the, in the newspapers that we have today, in the documents you have today, that we might overlook what might be in there, that has so much information and so much history about what was going on then. Because there'll be something that we're doing today, just blase, blase, going to the 7-Eleven or whatever to pick up some newspaper, to pick up some magazine about the Kardashians, you know? <laughs> and years from now, there's an athlete, an athletic, uh, a decathlete did what? <laughs> yeah. Okay, next slide. Calvary County, that's where we are. <laughs> so that's an old map we have there, just comparable to where we are now, way up at North Beach. Next slide. I don't know if, 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 for those of you who are here before, this is one I want to show again. This is the vote that ended slavery in Maryland as of 1864. The Maryland Constitution, the third Maryland Constitution, ended slavery by passage of that Constitution. And just to show you what the vote was in our own Calvert County, now if you're voting for it, then that means you're voting for the amendment to for the, for the Constitution, which would end slavery, against means you're not for it, which would have kept slavery in place. Calvert County, 471 people, am I right? No, 57 people voted for it, 634 voted against it. And then when we look down here, we see that the actual vote, and this is a vote that actually did turn on this vote, the tide of the Constitution laid, I think that's the right way to phrase it, was found in favor of the Constitution and the end of slavery in Maryland only because the soldiers' vote was added. Because without that, the original vote was 29,536 against 27,541 for, which means if it had not been for the federal troops voting, then slavery would not have ended in Maryland in November of 1864. Were there any challenges to that because of the closeness? I, I think there was a challenge later on. There, there were subsequent uh, efforts within the within the, the General Assembly to uh, not so much to, to necessarily challenge that, but to get recompense for the fact of how close it was. So there was some effort sort of put back by the, the pro-slavery um, effort then. Were there yeah. blacks in the federal troops? Yes, there were, but they were not able to vote. Because I did look at this, and no blacks were able to vote. Now, where can we find that? Uh, this is, uh, well, we have, we have an actual, well, we, now we have online an exhibit that actually shows it. But it, it was part of the actual papers of the votes within, um, within the constitutional papers that we have in the archives. Ready to see that. And then, if you just get a general, general sense of the county from 1790 to 1860, the amount of free and enslaved blacks here was kind of 50 50. 
So just so you know, the black population in Calvert County was kind of mixed throughout the time of year. So in 1790, of all the citizens in, in uh, Calvert County, 8,600 8, citizens, 4,300 were enslaved. And we go down to 1810, 20 years, 4,068 were free, 3,900 were enslaved. Let's go right back to when slavery ends. 10,000, the Civil War begins. 10,447, that's how many overall citizens are in Calvert County. 4,609 4, were enslaved, 1,861 were free. So it's just another, another reason to sort of um, push the fact that you had to have papers if you could, because you couldn't assume that every single black person you saw in Calvert County was free, or every single person you saw in Calvert County was a slave. I will say, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Under 1790, you just have citizens mm -hmm. and enslaved in right. Calvert County. Right. So and some of those would have been blacks, free blacks too. Up in the 8,000. Yes. But, but you don't get that further breakdown until you get to 1820. Because you missed it in 1800, 1810. Right. Yeah, this is just taken from the census. Some of them did not show that. In 1820, they started saying citizen, enslaved, free black. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Now, this is why, because I want to get you some stories. Oh, sorry. Can't imagine that. But anyway, this is something I had brought before, and I looked into it a little bit deeper. Martha Washington, Martha Washington, well, hey, <laughs> Martha Wilson, a slave owner in Calvert County in Plum Point. So in this story, Martha talks about her, her enslaved property, her woman named Candace, 23, 24 years of age, who runs away. She says she'll have a, she will give a reward of $20 will be given if she's found in Calvert County. And if the above reward is taken out of that county and secured in jail, so that I get her again. The value of $50 in 1832 is approximately $1,300 in 2012. And then so in the census record right there, it shows approximately what Martha Wilson had as far as her property. She, there was, uh, <coughs> over, overall, there's 11 people in her household. But look, there's, there, now it says, it says there's nine free colored persons. So that's kind of interesting. But that's 1830, so that's two years before. So that's kind of interesting. And then uh, as far as free white persons, male is 1, 30 to 31, 30 to 39, and then free white persons, female, 60 to 69. I'm thinking that's Martha. I'm not sure, though. Not sure. Next slide. I tried to track Box to Washington a few years of the census, like we used to say, 30 years of the census, to see what her, her life is like. You know, what, what does she have? So in 1810, apparently she has 14 slaves. There's two males there. Uh, these are the, these are the, the three pre per persons who live there. Two were children, less than 10, one 16 to 26, one female who's probably the head of the household, maybe that's Martha, who's 45. 14 slaves, approximately 11,200, if I'm going by my $800 estimate. To, to go 20 more years, I mean two more years, which is said two more census records, in 1820, She's got three colored who are probably working for her. And we see that amount there, three, three colored, but she has four slaves, approximately 3,200, if you're going by my eighteen eight hundred dollars figure. 1830, 11 total people in the household, three colored. One, one, three, one, and three. Okay, next slide. What we found also about Martha, Wash Martha Wilson is that she put in a claim, uh, a War 1812 claim. Now what happened within the War of 1812 claims? Because when the British came over, the British were offering freedom for blacks who would escape from their slave owners to fight for the British. Sometimes it came through, sometimes it didn't, but they would run away. Martha Wilson was someone who petitioned for recompense because 14 of her slaves ran, or she, 14, 14 of her slaves ran away to join the British. And so this is what she says in the second phrase. That on or about the 24th of October, 1814, your memorialist, I'm not really sure why they use that term, but that's what it is, the memorialist, lost 14 slaves valued at about $5,000, as will, as will particularly appear on the something list. list. Oh, thank you. Uh, which was forcibly and wrongfully taken out of the possession of our memorialists by the British forces within the United States during the war for which losses shall and ample remuneration 
is claimed under the state's and treaties and conventions, right? So she's basically saying, I lost fortune in my state to those British pay me. Well, who's going to pay it though? I'm looking for the claim. Well, that's the thing. I mean, just she but she's petitioning. She's petitioning the, Mar the uh, American government to pay her for these slaves. Next slide. And now, this is what's really fascinating about the suit is that so she has a person, Thomas James Hollingshead, does come forward to vouch for the fact that she did have four genus slave individuals, and they, they did run away, and he does believe that they ran away to join the British. And this is like what's great as far as a genealogical find, if someone has a relative, you know, who maybe is related to a Wilson family back in the early 19th century, whatever, because here are these names of enslaved blacks. Wow. Sam, Value 20, Deb, Jenny, Allie, uh, Lila, maybe Lila, Vinny, Frank, whatever, uh, Hosey, Ford, and, and their approximate values, which now, the thing that's a little bit different about it is that the value comes out to be 4,020. So unfortunately, James sort of cut her out of a, like, and what, uh, you know, almost $1,000, but still, you know, he's vouching for her claim. I have not been able to find yet if she actually ended up getting paid for this. But part of the study that we have done in the archives is of these, these, um, War 1812 claims, because and that's what they were all about. And as much as possible, within these claims, they do mention how many ran away and their names, if at all possible, the value, and it would be the names of the person who petitioned, petitioned for them. So that would be a clue as to who they might have worked for, where they might have lived, for whom. And again, as far as genealogy goes, it could be a big find for someone who has these type of connections. Next slide. But if you go back to your own. The census records. If you go back to our census records, okay. a couple of you know, three, three slides back. It's kind of interesting because you see in, in 10, 1810, she had 14 by 1820. You know, she's she's only got four. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So when she talks about her her loss in 1812, right, right. 1814. I know. Yeah, exactly. but she had 14 here. But in 1823, she's talking about they ran away. Well, I thought it was for the war. Oh, right. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Right. Yeah. Now, and also, that's, see, so that's my, my addition. Right. I said 800 times that, but this guy's like, nah, it's 4,020. <laughs> but that's very true. Right. Exactly. Uh, this is just an example of someone else who's a committal notice. This is just, this, this, again, how specific they were about who someone was. This is a young man who says he was born free, 15 years of age, 4 feet, 4, 5 feet, and 5, 5 inches high. Again, very, very small. Scar on his left cheek, one on the left side of his neck. And Francis Stevens, the sheriff of Calvary County. The sheriff, for whatever reason. And if he's free, the reason is he's free. He can walk around where he wants to walk. But the sheriff picks him up, puts him in jail, and unless somebody can claim him, someone comes and he proves that he was free, he could be sold back. He could be sold, not back, he could be sold into slavery. Right. Next slide. That's the Committal Law 1802, Act Related to Runaway Servants and Slaves. Now, one thing I think is, is also interesting about this law is that at the end it says, the only protection given the prisoner was the restriction that the purchaser could not take its purchase out of the state for two years. And this benefited the late arriving initial owner more so than the sold off slave. So it's almost like for two years you're sort of in limbo as to whether someone can prove or disprove your being free or a property of someone else. Next slide. Uh, someone else from this area, Henry Hillary, had uh, a Bill who ran away. Bill, he was about 24, 24, 24, 26 <coughs> years of age, also from Plum Point. And he thinks this person may have run away in, uh, further in Maryland or the District of Columbia or in Bladensburg, Prince George's County, as we know that's up Route 4. Value of $200 is $5,400 today. Uh, next slide. What I found for Mr. Hillary is that 1830, just remind me again, what was that year? Go back one, please. Okay, 1840, okay. Thank you. Uh, so 1830, he has supposedly three, well, no, these are all, these are all free, no slaves. So he, he apparently has, he does acquire some slaves in the next couple of years, in 1840, he has 30 slaves. So he really has built up quite the amount of property at that point. And next slide. 
Here's a Mr. Arab who has a slave who runs away named John Galloway. Again, I think, I think I've shown mostly here, more so than some other as far as uh, assumptions, which is that an enslaved person only had one name. I, I think I saw many of these ads here that uh, an enslaved person often did have a first and a last name. So there, there's, there's that possibility that if they were to keep this name, 1839, freedom comes to Maryland, 1864, possibility if you look for John Galloway in 1870, maybe it's this person. Maybe if they're you know, add about 30 some years. Mm -hmm. Dark color, very stout, well made, about 5 feet 10 inches, clothing not recollected. He has a wife and children in Baltimore and is likely to be lurking about there as he was seen with his wife on Sunday. Wow. I mean, how specific is this person about what he was doing? It's almost like, well, if you knew all this, didn't you think he might run away? <laughs> what were you thinking? Plum Point, Tower County, Benjamin Island, 1839. Uh, next slide. And then, I know this is very dark over here, but 1850 census shows that RV is real value on the census, approximately $900 in value. I think that, that enslaved people work as part of personal property, not real estate property, which of course would be the land. So I think, unfortunately, this does not tell me how much Mr. Ireland might have owned in enslaved and personal property in 1850. In 1860, however, $1,200 in real, in, uh, real value, real estate value, and $700, and also within his property is a black laborer, 22 years of age, and if he's a laborer, this is on a federal census, that means he's free, that person is free. In 1870, so slavery's over, then Mr. Ireland is 66, so the age confirms he's got John B. Ireland, which, perhaps, which is this John Ireland, who's probably his son, and they have four black people living with them. So, and Mary Jones, domestic servant, Fran France Jones, six, George John, five, Sally A. John, one. So that would be something, as far as genealogy goes, if someone had a connection to the Ireland family, or the, yeah, the Ireland family, and perhaps had a connection to a, a Jones family, and they were in, in this area of Calvert County, apparently, around this time of 1860 to 1870, or 1870 on, they were living together. They were working together. Now again, that's after slavery, but that that could be a further a further history of the of the of a, of a community that stayed together for however long. Because he's only 22, then she's only 21. Now I would have been freaked out if there had been some M's down here, but you know you don't see that. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. And this is just showing you what our website looks like as far as the War of 1812. If you want to go there, and you can click on to Calvert, and you will see a listing of the different uh, claims that we have for any person from Calvert County, such as Martha Wilson. Uh, next slide. Just an example of some of the names we have there. Minty Caden, Betty Coates, Suki Coates, Richard Cornelius, Covington, William Dare, E. Ford, Phyllis Green, Betty Gross, Daniel Gross. Just some names out of there, those family names, just something that piqued your interest. Uh, next slide. We also have records which we actually copied from the, um, well, we have some from the Maryland State Archives themselves, muster rolls, but also from the National Archives, United States Pinson records, which is to say that if someone worked or someone actually fought in the war, which blacks were able to do after 1864, they were due a pension, a pension, and then if they themselves were not able to apply for it, their, their descendants were able to, or their mother or father could. Yes? You, 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 since you're into this, the, yes. the other mechanism, that, which emphasizes the property, by 1864, you're in Maryland, Delaware, and you can kind of see the handwriting on the wall where yeah. the war of slavery is going to go. You could take your slave slaves of military age, Enlist them in the colored troops and get three hundred dollars. Exactly. Before. And they were free, although they were enlisted in the army. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the drill was you had to prove that they were yours. Or right. You just weren't some by right. people right. and turn them in for three hundred dollars. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Shanghai or whatever you call it. So right. yeah. So uh, a lot of the people who all of a sudden cross from uh, somebody's property, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're into the Troops and, and the paperwork was just like if you're selling property, 
that grew mm -hmm. property. So the, it was. But the day the day the slave was enlisted, he was quote free, although he had military mm -hmm. obligations. Right. And the property settlement was doctors come out of the courthouse. Mm -hmm. That's true. Like Z, the you know. Exactly. So pension records as well you can look at. And next slide. And that's some of the names of persons that we have in Calvert County for whom we do have pension records. A uh, Bowen, a uh, Hansel, or Hensel, uh, a James Boone. And that would be found on the page where I showed you the overall MSA slavery.msa.gov. You would get to this one. This area of the that where there it is again, slaverymsa.gov. And next slide. Okay. Um, part of the whole rigmarole of this is, <laughs> is that at the beginning of this, we had a young Mr. Turner pass around the ledger for you guys to sign. And the idea of that is that about a year or so ago when I was first here, I had a book, which I have, but I've got to bring it, <laughs> because I wanted it to be a, uh, a uh, reminder to you guys of what history is. And just as I mentioned early on about the birth certificates and census records, that no matter whatever you do, you're already on those, so you're already a part of history. Your children be there one month old, they're already a part of history, is that this is a part of history. This day can be a historic, whoa, <laughs> event. Because, because the ledger that you sign can go to the Bay, the Bayside History Museum. Yeah, the museum. And so, and it'll say your name on it, it will say the date, it will say perhaps that I spoke, I guess I'll put my name there, that I spoke. Um, and then I wanted to say county, because uh, certainly in, in my history, what many of my, my uh, relatives would say, my older relatives would talk about when, when I would say I was uh, you know, Chris or Dolores' son or Julius' son, uh, and they would say, well, what's your last name, Haley? And this is before Uncle Alex and all, but they'd say, oh, is that the Michigan Haley's or that's whatever it is? Or it'd be, you know, if you're in a state, they talk in terms of counties. Mm -hmm. You know, you're of the, the, um, the Turner, the, the, the um, the Alamo County Turners, or the, uh, uh, the the Charles County Queens, you know, and that's how that's how it goes. That's how genealogy works so much. And when you when if you've done that in different states so many times in the different states, they will break it down toward county records. And so that's why I wanted you guys to also put down what county you I I will say you're claiming allegiance to, <laughs> because years from now, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. Someone will look at this ledger and they'll know that you, all of you, were in this place between these hours on February 22nd to hear someone speak. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it's after three, so I think you guys are supposed to be at your Oscar party. <laughs> If you have questions, I'll start them.